Hey guys, welcome back. You know, like many of you, I had the chance recently to go see Oppenheimer. Huge recommendation, excellent movie. You know, there was a character in there based off of a real world scientist. His name was Edward Teller. You may remember he was the one proposing the super, a large two-stage thermonuclear weapon. That proposal immediately reminded me of the one and only Nova Bomb from Halo. For those that may not be familiar, it was a bomb so powerful it could crack planets into pieces. So join me this week as we explore a top secret project called Sundial, the United States attempt to build what we will probably be the closest we'll ever come to a no kidding real world Nova Bomb. So let's start by talking about what the Nova Bomb was and how you know it was used and how it worked. Diving into the nuclear engineering portion of it, and I'm sorry in advance, we're going to get a little bit nerdy here. The Nova Bomb was described as being composed of nine fusion, aka thermonuclear, H-bomb, what have you, warheads. They were encased in a material called lithium triteride, triteride, whatever, armor, which supposedly boosted the yield a hundredfold. The first time the bomb is actually acknowledged was in the book First Strike, when then Vice Admiral Whitcomb said that he was going to use it to destroy Reach, and this was after the Covenant had clearly won and were glassing the planet. However, after some consideration, instead they purposely allowed one to be captured, and it was later detonated by the Covenant on board one of their ships. Inadvertently, they didn't intentionally. But that, you know, happened in orbit of the planet Joyous Exaltation, and according to the books, I believe this is the Ghost of Onyx now, that led to the destruction of 300 Covenant ships, all life on the nearby planet of Joyous Exaltation, and cracked its local moon into pieces. So you can imagine, pretty explosive, right? Well, it was actually used once more, and it was kind of a tragic circumstance. At the very end of the Human Covenant War, a Spartan team, great team, detonated one on a Sanghali world. Unfortunately though, it came after the Great Schism and a changing of alliances. They unfortunately were running radios black and they didn't have contact with the outside world, so they didn't realize that their mission had been called off, not at least until it was too late. So how does this all relate to Project Sundial? I mean, what even is that? And or the Fed's gonna come arrest me after I make this video? Well, yes to all of them. Before we jump into too much, I think it's time for a very brief and bear with me it's going to be brief recap on nuclear engineering and nuclear weapons theory the first thing to understand is the concept of fission versus fusion in a fission warhead like the one detonated over nagasaki the one that we hear about when it comes to the trinity test manhattan project and oppenheimer well it used conventional explosives to implode focusing kind of a lens that you're really squeezed either uranium or plutonium visible material and that led to a runaway reaction where the atoms were splitting, releasing neutrons that split other nearby atoms. And when you do that at an atomic level, obviously it releases an absurd amount of energy. This is exactly what you remember if you had a chance to go see Oppenheimer. Again, really good movie. You may also remember, like I said, someone by the name of Edward Teller. He was the one petitioning Oppenheimer to create the super. That was referring to what we later know as a thermonuclear weapon, a massive two-stage fusion warhead. Now, how exactly is that different from fission? Well, in fusion, you're not breaking atoms apart, instead fusing them together. And most conventional weapons use deuterium and tritium, heavy hydrogen isotopes, to create helium. That's actually the same process that occurs in the sun. So let's get really nerdy about it. How does thermonuclear fusion warhead really work? in as much as I can layman's terms. Well, like I said, most modern designs are actually referred to as Teller Ulam configurations. That is in honor of their creators, obviously Edward Teller and one of his coworkers, Ulam. It uses a traditional fission explosion to initiate. That's right, you're gonna use an atomic bomb as the trigger for an even bigger thermonuclear hydrogen H-bomb, what have you. The way it works is that initial fission explosion releases a lot of X-rays and neutrons. In the cases of these thermonuclear warheads are specifically made to reflect the X-rays back inward. That compresses a rod of typically plutonium and that starts another fission reaction. Now you may be asking yourself how does x-ray which is electromagnetic radiation apply pressure? Well light actually does apply pressure which is weird because you'll probably tell me well light doesn't have mass maybe it does I don't know I'm not a quantum theorist but when you're making that much of x-rays you know in a nuclear explosion it actually exerts an obscene amount of pressure and so that initiates like I said another fission reaction of that plutonium material. Well inside of that plutonium rod you have something called called lithium deuteride. 
that actually causes itself to undergo fission as well. And so the lithium splits and tritium, again, one of the heavy hydrogen isotopes breaks off. That alongside free deuterium then becomes, you know, very highly compressed, extremely hot, and it starts to fuse together, creating helium. And the reason that works is a lot of forces. You have Coulomb's force, which is like atoms trying to repel each other, especially very tiny ones like hydrogen. You're obviously very simple one proton and one neutron, sometimes extras, especially when we talk about these heavy hydrogen isotopes. Isotopes. And then you also have the strong force, which is what, you know, binds atoms together. To spare you too much detail, uh, it creates a lot of energy, right? Big boom. So let's, you know, take this to Project Sundial. Then what was that exactly? Well, it was Edward Teller's brainchild for a 10,000 megaton warhead. Yes, you heard that right. 10,000 megatons, 10 gigatons. We're not, you know, no gigachad. Now we're talking gigatons. See, the reason that's allowable is there's no scaling when it comes to thermal nuclear weapons. Teller actually surmised it would be possible to create multiple stage weapons. You know, contemporary weapons are two stage, at least in the United States, fission then fusion. Well, you could always use three stages, fission, fusion, and then you actually initiate that onto a much larger fusion reaction. That's actually how the Soviet Union was able to scale a weapon to create the Tsar Bomba. Tested at 50 megatons, but theoretically that same design would have actually exploded at 100. But like I said, there's no scaling. So in Teller's design, a thousand megaton fusion warhead itself, probably a multi-stage system, would be used to ignite sundial. The concept is relatively simple. Yeah, more stages, more boom. You can more or less scale the energy as much as you want. The bigger the explosion, obviously, the more you can compress of lithium and create more helium through fusion, creating a bigger explosion. Now, when Teller told his fellow scientists, obviously the actual contents of their discussions are highly classified even in the 1950s, some were horrified and some were just dumbfounded as to why. A 10 megaton warhead on a missile is more than effective to destroy strategic targets. What could you possibly need a 10 gigaton warhead for? Especially if you run the math, a weapon that large detonated 20 Eight miles above the surface, effectively halfway to space, would set fire to a portion of the earth as large as this nation of France. I mean, that's a lot of people you would be killing indiscriminately, not just that, but the environmental catastrophe you'd cause and all sorts of horrific consequences. But you might be asking, Cabazon, that's not much of a planet cracker. You're just burning the French. And I imagine some of you probably think that's a good thing. Well, yes, you know, not just obviously the French, but it's not a planet cracker. And that's because the energy to do so is absurd. And well, it's well outside the capability of us, the UNSC, and most likely the Covenant. Unfortunately, the Nova's effects are a bit of fiction. And I know some of you are already sharpening your spears, but allow me to expound a little bit. It's important to understand the concept of gravitational binding energy. That's the potential energy of gravity that keeps planets coherent and, you know, in a ball. That's why we don't spin away. Earth is roughly 200 quetajoules. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right because that's so deep on the metric scale that I got lost. That is 2 times 10 to the 32nd power. That's a lot, right? Well, back when I was a kid, a NASA planet, this was about 4.5 billion years ago, struck Earth and that led to the formation of the moon. This is a leading hypothesis, a giant impact theory. That caused a peak of roughly 100 quetajoules of kinetic energy at impact, so roughly half the gravitational potential. Did it destroy Earth? Well, no, Earth didn't crack apart. It did get really weird for a bit, like wobbly and spinning chunks off, but still not breaking apart. It wasn't habitable in the slightest, obviously, but it still kind of stayed coherent. So, taking this back to Project Sundial, how big was that in comparison? Well, despite being an awe-inspiring 10 gigatons, it was still 2.4 quadrillion times less powerful than the impact that formed the moon. So no, unfortunately, I don't think any of us are going to develop a bomb so strong that you can crack the planet. And well, why would you? Even if you couldn't, you could do something like a surface detonation, a massive crater, but more importantly, all of that ejecta, vaporized material, and what have you blown into the atmosphere would be highly radioactive. You'd probably poison the earth forever. And we would all die horrifically after a few years from cancer and or turning into ghouls and we would be in bunkers and fighting in subways and collecting bottle caps. This is obviously a follow-up metaphor. Please laugh. This, you know, is probably a bad thing you're thinking to yourself. And yes, well, depending on your goal, if your goal is the end of humanity, maybe it's not so bad, right? We've all been there. Deadening it up high, though, ensures the heat component cooks the surface. And so that's why you have trade-offs. Air bursting a nuke is typically a little bit better because you get more pressure wave and heat effects than simply creating a ton of fallout by detonating on the ground 
ground, where some of those effects are muted by terrain. And even that high, I mean, you're still cooking a portion of the planet, and the blast wave, you know, even though there's energy losses propagating through the atmosphere and whatnot, it would probably destroy a huge portion of at least the hemisphere facing the weapon. Now, stepping back into Halo for a second, we know that Vice Admiral Whitcomb said the Nova bomb had nine nuclear warheads. So let's talk a little bit about what the hypothetical yield of that actually would be. You know, we know it's not a planet cracker, but how close is it to Sundial? Well, let's assume each of those warheads was 100 megatons, you know, roughly twice the size of Sarbamba, so we're giving the UNSC some credit they're more advanced 500 years down the road. That would still, you know, Wickham said it was a 100-fold increase yield. So 9 munitions, 100-fold increase, that's roughly 90 gigatons, so 9 times as strong as Project Sundial. Not exactly capable of destroying a planet, but plenty more enough to destroy destroy a fleet in orbit, especially because the Covenant love to space up tightly, incinerate, you know, a massive portion of a planet, or, you know, like I said, surface detonation, poisoning it forever, too radioactive for life. Still meeting, right, his intent of destroying Reach and or destroying a fleet. But, and you might be disappointed, you might be like, wow, well that's kind of lame, like I hate your videos, you just take all the fun parts of lore and make them boring. Let me close with the fact, at least, with, that the fundamentals of the Nova Bomb are actually quite sound. While lithium, you know, triteride is actually a made up element, lithium deuteride is actually the main stay fuel for modern nuclear weapons. You could actually conceivably use nine, potentially more, to create an implosion, focusing the fusion effects to a center point, creating a ton of fission, as well as all those x-rays, and that could actually compress a ton of fusion fuel fuel to create an unholy unimaginable amount of energy will it crack the planet eh, probably not will it kill about everything on the surface and make it too toxic to survive well yeah and at the end of the day that's kind of the intent right of the nova bomb well i hope you guys enjoyed this video and thanks for joining if you're not subscribed to the channel consider doing so i make videos like this exploring some of the realistic and or weird aspects of halo and maybe you'll enjoy it i try not to go too deep into the science for today's video mostly because i don't want to bore y'all and also because i don't want the feds to show up at my house and disappear me to a black site somewhere. If I don't go missing, be assured I'll be around next week. And in the meantime, be safe and take care.